This is going to be chapter 15 in the book of Revelation, and we're going to see some things about worship in heaven. And this is going to be the entire chapter, starting in verse 1. It says, And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels, having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. And the first thing we're going to see is the tribulation that's going on in the world won't affect the people or the worship in heaven. Uh, the wrath of God is about to be released even more than it was, and more devastation is about to happen on earth in that future time period. And even with all of these things happening, this doesn't take away from the worship going on in heaven. And it should be the same way in our worship toward God. What the wicked world is doing should not cause us to lose sight of the Lord Jesus Christ. We shouldn't be so worried about the world that we lose sight of God. We shouldn't be so worried about politics and what the president is doing, what he does or he doesn't do. Is it going to affect God's plan and the things laid out in the book of Revelation? When it's all said and done, it's going to turn out just like the Bible said. We shouldn't lose focus on the Savior because of school shootings and terror attacks and wars and rumors of wars. Some people will get into the Alex Jones stuff and that's all they'll think about. They'll lose sight of Jesus Christ and what's really coming and their whole life will be just a big depression of fear. And although hell is breaking loose on earth, this doesn't stop the people and beings in heaven from worshiping God. And it shouldn't stop us from enjoying the blessings of God and our salvation. The wrath of God will be poured out on the earth. And God has a cup of wrath in his hand. The more a nation or people sin, it fills up their cup. Just like in Genesis fifteen sixteen, it says, The iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. And when the cup gets full, God turns it over. He pours out his wrath. And when Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins, he took our wrath. He took the cup. And this is what Jesus was referring to when he said, Let this cup pass from me. In Matthew twenty six thirty nine, he knew that he would be separated from the Father when he died on the cross. And he didn't particularly want that. But he voluntarily laid down his life for us. And the Bible says it pleased the Lord to bruise him. So John sees another sign in heaven because this is the time of Jacob's trouble. Jacob's trouble, not the church's trouble. God is dealing with the Jews and the Jews require a sign. The signs come back during this future time and he sees these seven angels that have these seven last plagues and vials. And notice the constant use of the number seven in the book of Revelation and in the Bible. This is the number of perfection. It is God's number. But number two, we see the people have the victory. Revelation 15.2 says, And I saw as it were a sieve glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. These things going on in the world aren't bringing anyone down in heaven. They may not. They may know about what's going on down there, and they may not. I mean, if they read the Bible before they went to heaven, then of course they know what's going on down on the earth, even though they're not seeing it. But even with all that going on, they still have the victory. And these tribulation saints have endured to the end and overcome the Antichrist. They have gotten the victory over the beast because they didn't worship him. They have gotten the victory over his image. They didn't worship his image. And they have gotten the victory over his mark. They didn't take the mark of the beast or the number of his name, which is 666. And the, the verse implies the mark could be something different than the number. But they got the victory over the devil. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And just like us today, when we worship, we can worship better knowing that we have the victory. We got the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. If you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, then you are on the winning side. And any person who takes God's side comes out a winner. 
Second uh, Corinthians 2 and 14 says, Now thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ. Uh, 1 Corinthians fifteen fifty seven. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then 1 John 5, 4. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. And these saints are realizing more and more every minute as they stand on this sea of glass that they have gotten the victory. Imagine standing on the sea of glass that's like unto crystal. Job says it is a molten looking glass. It is a body of water straight above your head under the third heaven. Uh, Psalms 148.4 talks about it. It says, Praise Him, ye heavens of heavens, and ye waters that be above the heavens. If you haven't studied that out, that's a very interesting study. And this is the same water that was stained red by the eternal blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this same water we will pass through going up to heaven during the rapture of the church. This is when we get victory over death. If you're alive at the rapture, you'll never die. If you're dead at the rapture and you're saved, you'll rise from the dead. Your soul would have already been with Jesus Christ, but your dead body will rise and change. It'll meet your soul and, and your body will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. So they have the victory. And number three, the people have heavenly instruments in their worship. Revelation 15.2 says, And I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. The church of Christ believe it is a sin to use musical instruments during worship. I have even heard some say they believe you are going to hell for using a piano during worship. So I guess they are more holy than these saints in heaven. I suppose they are more holy than God because he is willing to let these saints worship with instruments in heaven. Heaven. Show the Church of Christ cult leader these verses when he gives you a fit about instruments. Show him the book of Psalms where it says, it talks about the harp and other instruments. If he says, well, that's Old Testament, then show him Colossians 3.16, which says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. A verse in the New Testament says, admonishing one another in psalms and hymns. Well, those verses about the harp and things, that's in the book of Psalms. And we can admonish one another in psalms. So, don't let them guys talk you out of instruments. It's just silly religion and tradition that they have and they want to condemn others that don't go by their tradition so that's colossians and the new testament pauline epistles the most relevant relevant books doctrinally for the church age tells us to use psalms if you can use psalms psalms talks about instruments so why can't we use instruments we can use them. Uh, number four, they sing some songs that praise the Lord. Revelation fifteen three and 4 says, And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. Okay, so these guys sing the song of Moses. Because it was said of them, these are they which keep the commandments of God. They sing the song of the Lamb because they have the faith of Jesus Christ. Just like in that verse, Revelation fourteen twelve. here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So they bring out the great hymns of the faith, hymn book, and sing these two songs. These songs, like mo most music should do that in worship, give praise to Jesus Christ. That is the true purpose of music. It isn't to dance in the flesh. The real godly music gets to your heart before it gets to your hips 
and your feet. And like the old preachers say, a dancing foot and a praying knee don't grow on the same leg. And many times throughout the Bible, dancing is associated with very bad things. But look at the praise this song gives to the Lord. It says, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. It calls him great, marvelous, calls him God Almighty, just and true, King of Saints. It talks about the fear of the Lord. It reminds us that he is holy. So see, songs should give praise to God, not man. And they should say his name. Lord is not just a title, it's also a name. God Almighty is a title, Lord God Almighty, King of Saints, that's that's his name, he's a King of Saints, he's Jehovah, he's Jesus Christ, and the song teaches us to fear him, well we should fear God, he can, he can uh, let anything happen to us, he can let the devil get a hold of us if we're sinning, if we're lost, he allows us to go to hell, and notice they sing, about just and true are thy ways. Who is the way, the truth, and the life? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Everything he does is just. Everything he does is true. If he puts somebody in hell, he's just in doing so. Uh, he wrote the Bible. The whole thing's true. The Bible is without error. And look at what happens to a world that doesn't want God. They feel His wrath. That's why you should fear Him. Fear God. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. And notice the song also says, Thou only art holy. That couldn't be any more true. God is holy. Man is sinful. God lived as a man on earth for 33 years and never sinned. He was, not he was touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. He never sinned one time. God is holy. Man is sinful. Revelation <clears throat> Revelation fifteen four says, Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. In the millennium, the nations will come to worship Jesus Christ if they know what's good for them. Isaiah 66, 23 says, And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. Zechariah eight twenty three. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, In those days it shall come to pass that ten men shall take hold out of all languages of the nations, even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, We will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. And number five in this worship service in heaven, it's, it shows us that they prophesy. Revelation fifteen four says, Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy, for all nations shall come and worship before thee. For thy judgments are made manifest. That's a prophecy. When it says, For all nations shall come and worship before thee. If you read that and believe it, then you know something is going to happen in the future where all nations come and worship before Jesus Christ. Actually, it's going to happen whether you believe it or not. But if you have a Bible, you can every day read something that hasn't happened yet. And... You're reading where God tells you the future. And that's what they're doing here. They are telling the future. All nations will come worship before Jesus Christ. And this is part of their worship. And when a preacher gets up and tells you what the Bible says and proclaims the prophecies of the Bible, then he is prophesying. And I'm not talking about false prophets getting up and proclaiming some unbiblical thing. They are just speculating. Um, when a man gets up and proclaims what God said in his book, then he is prophesying. 
And this happens in our worship services today. One day a man got up and told you that you're going to go to hell if you don't get saved. He's prophesying. He knows from the Bible what happens to everyone that rejects Jesus Christ. He knows their future in that sense. And we are also lacking uh, preaching about the end times. The prophecy guys are writing books about the end times, but they are mostly just trying to sell books. There is a lack of prophecy being taught and preached. People believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, but they don't know why they believe it. And this is why they end up being deceived by the other crowd. The average Christian couldn't tell you where the rapture is in the Bible. The little above average Christian might could tell you where it is, but they don't know how to explain why those verses teach a pre-tribulation rapture or why the Bible teaches it. And then the ones above the average Christian think that you can find the pre-trib rapture in Matthew 24, which you can't. So then they will get confused by the post-trib pre-wrath doctrine. And they have no idea why it, is, why it is impossible for a Christian to go through the time of Jacob's trouble. This is because of lack of preaching and teaching on prophecy. The Bible is more than just don't do this and don't do that. The Bible tells us our future and it has us has it laid out and telling us what we need to do to make our future be better. But most of the prophecy discussed today is just books that have fancy covers and they're just designed to sell people stuff and get to people's flesh more than teaching the Bible. But number six, they are all dressed up. Revelation fifteen five and 6 says, after, And after that I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. And the seven angels come out of the temple, having the seven plagues, clothed in pure and white linen, and having their breasts girded with golden girdles. So just like when you go to your worship service at church, you're all dressed up. Today we shouldn't judge a man by his clothes. I'm not, and I'm not one of the, those people that think you have to run around in a suit and tie to look like a Christian. The Bible talks about wearing modest apparel in 1 Timothy 2.9. So don't wear anything with sinful drawings on it. Don't wear clothes that draw unnecessary attention. Don't wear clothes that are revealing. Isaiah 47, 2 through 3 shows us that when we uncover the thigh, this shows our nakedness. Any skirts or dresses or shorts that uncover the thigh will show our nakedness. It's wrong for a woman to wear clothes that show off her body. And they can become a stumbling block to men who will lust and commit adultery with that woman in their heart. And I don't believe the Bible teaches we all have to wear a suit and a tie. Wear clothes that aren't sinful, and that's fine. One day, though, we will be able to see a person's righteousness by the clothes they have on. And these angels in Revelation fifteen six are wearing pure and white linen. They also have their breasts girded with golden girdles. And in heaven, these saints are also clothed the same way. The fine linen is the righteousness of saints. They are all dressed up during this worship service in heaven. Uh, but for today, don't judge a person. Don't look down on them because of their clothes. James 2, 3 says, And ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool. Uh, the Bible is against this. I've heard men not wanting to listen to a preacher who isn't wearing a tie or something. A lot of times the modern day soft preachers wear the laid back clothes and since their messages are so weak and soft, this makes people think that the message will be soft if someone isn't wearing a suit and tie. But the importance is in the message and not in the clothes the man is wearing. Uh, many teach you have to wear a tie because it will offend your brother if you don't. And that may be true, but it's sad that people look so much on the outward material things that they will judge you 
over not having on a pretty tie. Instead of listening to the word being taught or preached, they are looking at what the guy is wearing. But I've heard good sermons from people who weren't wearing a suit and tie. Um, you don't want to go so far the other way and be a 60-year-old man dressed up like a teenager. I remember before I was even saved, going to like a youth conference or something with my church, and the... Uh, pastor would be like 60 years old and wearing teenagers clothes I'm thinking that guy looks ridiculous it doesn't look right when you wear clothes that aren't for your age range so I mean have some sense about what you wear but you don't have to wear a specific type of clothes the Bible doesn't teach that and number seven you feel God's power revelation 15 7 through 8 says and one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God, who liveth forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God, even and from his power. And no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. If it is real worship, then it will have God's power. There may not be screaming and shouting. People are different. They don't all react the same way. Verse 8 says, And the temple was filled with the smoke from the glory of God and from His power. The contemporary Christian rock bands will counterfeit this with fake stage smoke and loud guitars. Just like in those youth conferences, you'll, you'll go, it'll be a packed out stadium type place. you have the pastor dressed up like a teenager you have a bunch of 40-year-old men in a rock band coming out dressed up like teenagers. Uh, you have the fake stage smoke and loud guitars. Uh, they do no real preaching. He may say a verse and then it's just a bunch of stories. Um, their music can be powerful and they can say some stuff that'll make you cry, but... It isn't necessarily God's power. <clears throat> That's not <clears throat> not to say some good things may happen. Some people may actually get saved. But this really isn't what God wants. He wants the word preached. He wants real music. And that's where the power of God is, is with his word. The power of God is associated with the words of God. In Matthew twenty two, twenty nine, it says, Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. Second Corinthians six seven, by the word of truth, by the power of God. So the power of God is associated with His word. If you want God's power, make sure His word is a part of your life. The power of God is associated with real preaching. First uh, Corinthians one eighteen says, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved is the power of God. I was always amazed how at these youth conferences or youth uh, get-togethers, they'll have whole messages and never mention a death, burial, and resurrection. I mean, they'll say, believe on Jesus, but you're not telling the people what Jesus did and how he died for their sins. You're just thinking that they already know. A lot of people don't know what Jesus did. A lot of people don't even know that Jesus is God. They think he's just God's son. And they don't understand that being God's son makes you equal equal with God. Uh, but you, if you want the real power of God, find a real preacher of the word of God. And moving on, there are seven golden vials full of the wrath of God. As verse 8 says, And these vials are full of his wrath because of all of the constant sinning in the earth and the blasphemy against God. As I talked about earlier, the Bible talks about a cup that contains the wrath of God. The more a nation or people sin, the fuller the cup gets until he just tips it over. I gave the example in Genesis fifteen sixteen. It says, But in the fourth generation... They shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. So, a nation 
commit so much iniquity, it fills up their cup. Imagine what the cup of America would look like, possibly running over the sides with the wrath of God. And people in this country are so uh, always blaspheming God and sinning at such a high rate. It's like pouring a soft drink into a glass too quickly. It fizzes out over the top and goes all over the table. But here's some more verses about the cup. In Revelation 18.6, it says, Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her double, according to her works, in the cup which she hath filled, filled to her double. Jeremiah 51.5, For Israel hath, been, hath not been forsaken, nor Judah of his God, of the Lord of hosts, though their land was filled with sin against the Holy One of Israel. And a nation can be filled with sin. They are filling up the cup of the Lord's wrath. Romans 11.25 says, For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Notice the word fullness until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. It's a full cup. The cup gets full of the wrath of God. Revelation 15, 7. And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God who liveth forever and ever. The cup gets full and then God will make people drink it. Isaiah fifty one seventeen, Awake, awake, stand up, O Jerusalem, which has drunk at the hand of the Lord the cup of his fury. Isaiah fifty one twenty two. Thus saith the, thy Lord, the Lord, and thy God that pleadeth the cause of his people, behold, I have taken out of thine hand the cup of trembling, even the dregs of the cup of my fury. Thou shalt no more drink it again. Jeremiah twenty five fifteen through 17. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel unto me, Take the wine cup of this fury at my hand, and cause all the nations to whom I send thee to drink it. And they shall drink, and be moved, and be mad, because of the sword that I will send among them. Then took I the cup at the Lord's hand, and made all the nations to drink unto whom the Lord had sent me. Sinners love to get drunk, and they will get drunk on the wine of the wrath of God as it says in Revelation 14.10. But these are just a few examples of the cup of God's wrath. And if you don't want to drink the cup of God's wrath, then you need to get saved. The Bible says, He that believeth on the Son hath life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. If you're not saved, then the wrath of God is presently abiding on you. It's breathing down your neck. And the only way to get the wrath of God off of you and get into Jesus Christ is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as your crucified, buried, and risen Savior. In 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 4, it says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Jesus Christ died for our sins because we're sinners. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And that's why you need a Savior, because you're a sinner. You can't save yourself. You can't do anything good enough to get yourself to heaven. Uh, Romans 4.5 says, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Your own righteousness is filthy rags. You need the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ died. He died for your sins. He died by shedding his blood. Colossians 1.14 says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Jesus Christ was buried. And Jesus Christ rose again the third day, proving he is God. And without the resurrection, our faith is vain. If there was no resurrection, then Jesus Christ really wasn't God. He was just a sinner like me and you. And therefore, he could not pay for our sins because he would not be the perfect sacrifice. But if you want to be saved, come to Jesus Christ as a guilty sinner you are and put your faith and trust in 
Jesus as your crucified, buried, and risen Savior. Rely on Him and what He did as your payment for sin. And if you do this, you can have eternal life. Acts 16.31 says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. But this has been Revelation chapter 15 about what a worship service looks like in heaven.